Welcome, we're doing Come Follow Me, September the 9th through the 15th. Grab your journals, get your scripture markers out, and get ready to study. I gotta show you something. I'm gonna do this next week, so here's a little preview. I have my scripture markers out and handy. These things you can find at any store. I'm gonna have you look for Crayola markers. If you've ever been in my class before, you know that I am passionate about marking your scriptures and studying. This is gonna be a tool that we're gonna to use for Come Follow Me in the next few videos that we're gonna use, and I'm gonna have you find scripture markers. Everything is assigned a color, and we start studying the gospel with colors, and a great thing is it works on old caveman scriptures and our new digital scriptures because they're all dealing with colors. So I'm gonna invite you to find some of those this week. This week, I'm gonna ask you to get your journal out. Again, we're gonna journal, we're gonna do this. This is tough, you know. We're gonna to try to make this more interactive, but you gotta do your part. Here, let me just give you a little bit of a thing I've been thinking about, I'm gonna put these down. I hear a lot of time people say this at church. They say, I love the Come Follow Me program. Can we just say something? This, this is not a program. It's not, it was never designed to be a program. This, even this video becomes a tool and a resource for you to use so that you can connect up. That's the purpose of this, not so that it's a program. We're not doing a program. We didn't all of a sudden just go back to the Mosaic law and have rote rules that we have to follow. This is about you connecting. So with that, can you please subscribe below and uh, follow us? I appreciate everyone who's shared this on on uh, social media on facebook and i appreciate that you can follow me on at the steve scott v is in the t-h-e steve scott uh, my name is like a superhero uh peter parker bruce banner willy wonka you know so you can follow me on facebook that's where i post the majority of these things and we share them on that here's what we're going to do today and you can write this in your notes in your journal adversity is a blessing that's the title of today's lesson we are doing 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through 7. And title is, Be Ye Reconciled to God. So because this is not filmed in front of a live studio audience, I honestly, it's a challenge for me to be able to do this. And you're going to have to play along by pausing the video, doing some notes, using this as a resource to help you. So as you write these things down, we can do that. You can even, I'll move out of the way. You can pause, take a screenshot. I'll move out so my hand's not in it. You can take a screenshot of that and then use that and then zoom in if you need to do that. Now, we are going to study a bunch of different things. What I've done is I've blocked my scriptures. When I do personal study, because Paul in his writings, there's so many words and so he's so detailed in his writing that I don't use every single scripture, but I do what's called blocking, and some people call it chunking. So we take the very, you can call it gold panning for all that matters. We're gonna do things like that later. But what you do is you take little blocks of scriptures, little tiny spots that are really good gems, and we block those together, and that becomes our section that we're gonna study. So I've blocked them, put them in this nice little corner cloud over here. We're gonna use some of these. Now, in your journal to get started, so whether you're using, um, you're doing this alone, you're doing this with your family, you're doing this with teenagers, I have a few journal questions that I'd like you to journal first. First and foremost, here's the journal questions of the week. You can ask these, have a discussion in the family about this one, discuss it in a different way with little kids so that it makes sense, but here's the question. How does adversity bless our lives to be more like Christ? Question number one. Question number two. How does our heart change when we turn to God in adversity? Now repeat after me. You can say this out loud. Adversity is a blessing. Oftentimes we look at adversity as punishment, uh, horrible. People say things, they become Eeyore the donkey. Do you know what I mean? You just ask them how their days is like, oh. It's just one of those things, oh, bother, it was a horrible day. You know, awful. That was a horrible Eeyore impersonation. But they, it, the, the rain cloud, because adversity becomes this horrible experience, rather, adversity is a blessing. So repeat it again. Adversity is a blessing. That's going to be the title that we're going to follow as we talk about being reconciled to God today. So now that you 
have this discussion with your family or by yourself or in your journal, you're going to have better understanding of where, how you feel about this. Let's go to our scriptures. First Corinthians chapter or second Corinthians chapter one, verses three to six. In this, remember Paul in his writing to the Corinthians, as he was writing to the Corinthians before, they, some people didn't take this very well. They felt that Paul was picking on them a little bit. Remember, they have cultural changes in their converts to the church. They're trying to figure this out. And they're trying to understand Paul, and some people got offended by Paul. Um, maybe they couldn't read his words. Maybe it didn't make sense. Or maybe it's similar to today where a priesthood leader or someone asks us to do something, and they help us identify things that we can change, and we don't want to change. Mm -mm. Let me uh, let me share with you a story just for a second that that represents change. Just as we get beginning today, I heard this. I worked at the missionary training center for three years, and in that story, it, while I was there, uh, one of the directors would repeat a story that I've remembered ever since. He said that he had a young son that loved to like loved the vacuum cleaner. He loved it, which is strange. And but he loved it. And if any of you have little kids, you know they sometimes have weird things that they like and he loved the vacuum cleaner he pushed the vacuum cleaner he'd ride on the vacuum cleaner and he loved the vacuum cleaner and as time went on the vacuum cleaner died well they didn't know how to explain this to the kid he was sad he was upset he didn't know what to do so they went out and they made a family home evening of it they went and they bought a vacuum cleaner together yeah sound like fun family home evening the strange things we do with our kids and they bought him a new vacuum and they came home and they said we're going to take this other vacuum we're going to go out to the dumpster we're going to throw this vacuum away and he got really concerned and he was like no so he had a meltdown they started taking it out to the dumpster to throw this vacuum away and celebrate new vacuum and the little boy fell on the on the ground crying and his little dad's like we bought a new vacuum what are you doing man we got this figured out man we got a new vacuum. Don't cry. And he said, oh, I want the vacuum. So his dad said, it would it be okay? And he marched back in the house with him. He said, his wife, here's this little kid, like little kid in tow. And here's the vacuum coming back in. She's like, what the? And he looks at it and says, if I let you sleep with the vacuum tonight, will you be okay? The little boy said, yeah, I'll be okay. If the vacuum's gone in the morning, will you be okay? Yeah, I'll be okay. So that night, he's let the him, I'm sure he didn't put the vacuum in the bed. He set it beside the bed, and the little boy went to sleep. And that night, he went in and snuck it out and then threw it in the dumpster, and the kid woke up. Didn't need therapy. But the point is this. Sometimes in our moments where we need to change, we are like, the, we don't want to throw away the vacuum. We get so concerned. Like, please don't throw away the vacuum. I like it. We can have these favorite things that we love to hold on to. And Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, was sharing things with them, and they didn't want to let go. And so they got a little bit offended. So Paul starts sharing his letter, the second letter to the Corinthians. And in that, he shares a lot about adversity and this phrase of being reconciled to God. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. You can open that up. Got your journal out. We got our crayons out. We're ready to go. Here's what it says in the verses 3 to 6. Blessed be to God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble. Can you underline that phrase? By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. One of the blessings of tribulation and adversity is that my adversity allows me to be able to Mourn with those that mourn and understand people who are in similar circumstances. And verse 5 says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And I'm just going to read the first part of verse 6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. As we look at adversity being a blessing, in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6, one of the cool things that Paul says about adversity is that we are able to co find comfort. Now, we could make a cross-reference to 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 11, I think, where, where Lehi says, you know, there must needs be opposition in all things so that we'd able, be able to know. If we didn't have adversity, we wouldn't know comfort when we wouldn't know Christ in that comfort. 
So one of the blessings of adversity, think about the things that you've experienced in your life. Maybe it's recent adversity. Is, have you found any comfort? If you haven't, there's a formula. And if you have, you're able to share that with people who have gone through a similar experience. I hope that makes sense and we understand. Very first thing Paul says is, because I know Jesus Christ, and because I understand the atonement of Jesus Christ and I felt comfort, then I can help you in that moment. Chapter three, verse three. Paul goes on. So here's what I've done. I've made a list. I got my journal questions here. And then I write adversity is a blessing. And here's all the blessings of adversity that I've written right here. Now, I like this one a lot. Verse three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. What is he talking about? Do you guys, this is a bit of a discussion. What does it mean when something gets written on our heart? And we say, I know it with all my heart and I feel it in my heart. This is an interesting statement that Paul makes. As adversity is a blessing, it's a testimony in, becomes a testimony in my heart. Now, when Moses came down out of the mount, the Lord had inscribed in the tablet, um, on tablets, the Ten Commandments in stone so that they'd never be lost. But you ever notice that when we gain a knowledge of something in our heart, it also never leaves. I wrote off on the side right here, it's not in doing things like the law of Moses. The gospel is not a list of things to do. Can we just stop? Just a second, and let's have this discussion. There are things, a talk, Elder, Elder Bednar gave a talk on becoming a missionary before you go on a mission. That was 2008, I think. And he talked about the becoming. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about just doing things. It's not just about paying tithing, going to church, going on a mission, going to seminary, having family home evening. It's not a list, a checklist of to-dos. That's not what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about. Listen, this is what Paul said. Not in stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. When it gets sunk into here, you can do a cross-referencing scripture. Enos chapter 1, only one chapter, verses 3 and 10. The Lord teaches Enos by the power of the Holy Ghost that came into his mind, into his heart. And once it was in his heart, holy cow. You also want to do another interesting study since this is Come Follow Me and you, some of you want to go deeper. Look in the topical guide under heart and read all of the references when it comes to the heart. There's pages of them. And you can study that. Why? Look at Laman and Lemuel. Oh my goodness, look at this. I didn't even write this down. If adversity is a blessing, and I understand that it changes my heart, like Paul says, and it's written here, then it becomes a soft heart. I become soft hearted. And Laman and Lemuel became, you guys know? Say it hard hearted. Hard hearted. You'd write off on the side of your margin, just say, the opposite of writing in the fleshy tables of the heart is that my heart becomes hardened. The question that I had you write in your journal, how does our heart change when we turn to God in adversity? Think about it. Think about what you've gone through in your life. It's written here. And the atonement um, uh, just sinks deep. And uh, I think of all the those really tough times and um, the gratitude that I have that I went through them because they weren't easy and because the Lord wrote it in my heart now. So some of you might need a spiritual heart surgery to be able to understand this one because you become, you've become bitter in adversity. And Paul, in writing the Corinthians, said, I didn't write you to give you a checklist of things to do, but 
and it's not in stone, but it's in the fleshy tables of the heart that I'm talking to you. Remember, it's not a checklist of things. Adversity isn't one of those moments that we just get through. One of my cross-referencing scriptures that I, I studied in my, in my personal study was Messiah 23, 21 through 22, Helaman 12, 3, and Doctrine and Covenants 105, verse 6. I'm going to turn to one of those and just see if you want to turn to, let's go to Messiah chapter 20, 23, 21 through 22. I closed that out, so I'm going to reopen that. Messiah chapter 21, 21 through 22. Here's what he says. It said, and it came to pass, 23, I'm in 21. You'll notice that I don't edit these things because this is real. This is really how a class goes in my life. I'm not perfect at this, so I often make mistakes. Um, he says, Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Nevertheless, whoso putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it is with this people. As I have spiritual heart surgery and as I experience um, adversity, um, the Lord makes me a better person. Um, I'd like to go to Helaman because that was one of my ones that I really liked. It says a similar thing, but just a little different. Helaman chapter 12, verse, th verse 3. And thus we see that except the Lord does chasten his people with many afflictions, yea, except he does visit them with death and terror and famine and all manner of pestilence, they will not remember him. Remember in Alma 32 when the Lord says, Blessed is he that humbleth himself without being compelled to be humble. And this is the moment. So you notice how all the scriptures start to intertwine and, and the doctrines become clear. And that adversity truly is a blessing that the Lord looks at us and says, Yeah, now you get it. Well, let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, 17, where we're going to be 17 and 18, okay? 4 through 6. I'm going to change that. Let's go 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 8. For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. There's that word again. Circle it to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God, of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We become that treasure. You notice that? Um, of God, and it's not us. We're not. God, through adversity, makes a light shine in our life. We, we shine through adversity, um, and he shined in our hearts to give us light. And as that happens, now go to the next one, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Do you notice this? There is an eternal weight of glory. There is a spiritual deposit going into your bank account that you do not understand the investment, nor do you understand the return. You don't get it. When my, uh, I have a son that's, uh, that's living down in Utah. He's playing some football down there. And in order to get him, he doesn't have a driver's license yet. But in order to get him from point A to point B, or from the school back to where he lives, he has to go up a steepity steep hill. And he doesn't have a car, doesn't have a driver's license, and doesn't have a ride up that hill every day. The conversation with him and I was different. This is how I said it to him. There has to be some level of sacrifice on our part to understand the nature of the blessing that we are receiving. So it's okay to do hard things. Because in the adversity, you actually become stronger. And the investment is far greater than we even currently understand. You get a greater return on your money. That is, but we don't like paying it all the time, right? We don't like doing it. 
Now you think about all your experiences. I think it was Neil A. Maxwell that said, he's like, adversity is a necessary part of our life, but that doesn't mean that we get back in line and have another go at it, right? It's not like all of a sudden you do a hard thing, you're like, man, I wish I could do that again. No, but we are grateful for the adversity when it happens after it happens. Okay, let's go to chapter five, verse one through two. I hope this is all making sense today and that we're kind of feeling what Paul's going through. Verse one, two, four, six, and seven. Here he says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we we have a building of God, a house not have made it with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house from which from which is from heaven. Does that make let's just try, let's just dissect that for a minute? Teenagers will be going, What the? I don't even know what that's talking about. For if we know that our earthly house is of the Sabbath, in other words, he's saying, we have a body of flesh and bone. We know that. And we know that it's going to die. And when it dies, we will have an eternal house made with eternal things. Does that make sense? And he said, for we groan earnestly. So when you understand that, some people go, oh, I don't really want to be here. We groan. We go, I'd rather be with Heavenly Father. He knows that. Verse for, for we that are in this tabernacle, our body do groan, being burdened, because sometimes it's tough. I like this quote. My kids will complain sometimes, and they'll be like, I don't want to do it. And I say, it's okay that you don't want to do it as long as you do it. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense, Dad. I know, but it's okay that you don't want to do it. That's agency, as long as we do it, even though it's hard. Um. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. You're going to look at that and go, doesn't make any sense. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Can you make sure you make the next verse glow? For we walk by faith, not by sight. Adversity is a blessing. Why? Because it strengthens my faith. And you might not even know it. You might not even understand it. Maybe, maybe you've done physical exercise that's just been part of your daily routine. And then afterwards been like, man, my legs are strong. I didn't realize how far I had to walk to do that. Or doing manual labor, you realize how strong you were getting. Adversity is a blessing in that it strengthens my faith if we turn to God in our adversity. Can we make that clear? So some of you might be going through adversity thinking, man, this is horrible. I don't feel like I'm strengthening my faith at all. There is a key to this, my friends, that as we turn to God in our adversity, adversity is a blessing. It truly is. Parents, think of the times in your life where you've ever had to do something knowing that it would be hard for your children to do but knowing that the blessings and the return on the investment would be greater. I think we've done that as parents. Kids, um, I think it was Elder Holland who said, you're going to have to trust me because I've been where you are, but you haven't been where I am. And I love that quote, and it stuck with me for a long time going, Heavenly Father's been here before. He knows. He knows. Okay, I got this. He's got it with me. Okay, let's go to chapter five. Or we just did chapter five. So let's go to chapter seven. Oh, I love chapter seven. One of the blessings of adversity is that we can become a new creature. We can become a new creature or new people. So verse one, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I think of this. Above a temple, we've talked for the past few weeks about you're the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defiles this temple, him shall God destroy. Which temple is holy, which temple ye are. Remember we did that just a few lessons ago. Paul has repeatedly taught that your body is a temple. As I experience adversity, I become clean. Or I, as I tr experience adversity and I turn to God, I can be strengthened. In verse 1, he says, that we cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and that we become perfect holiness. 
Do you notice above the temple it says holiness to the Lord, house of the Lord, holiness to the Lord. As I experience adversity and as I turn to him, the end product is going to be something so, so wonderful. Um, verse 10. So I need to repent in, in these moments. Some of us need, I, Elder, or if you want a great study with this in verse 10, would you just cross-reference to Elder or President Nelson's talk in priesthood session about the blessings of repentance? This is a good one. And this is a great conversation to have with little kids and with teenagers and with all of us, for that matter, when we talk about, we talk about repentance. So this week, as you talk about verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So we could even, I could even write on the board, godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow, and the difference between them. I'll go back in the lesson just for a little bit. Remember, testimony is heart and not in doing things like the law of Moses. Worldly sorrow is doing the ABCs of repentance. Well, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and therefore I should be forgiven. True repentance is the change of the heart and the nature. So is it better? Remember, one of my favorite quotes is, direction is more important than location. So is it better to be 10 feet from hell walking away or 100 feet from hell walking towards it? So that's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is I understand that my actions have caused sorrow and pain. And as a result, not only for me, but for my, for my heavenly father as well. And it's distanced me from him. But that's godly sorrow. And so therefore, I repent so that I can come home and return closer to him. Worldly sorrow is I'm going to get caught. People aren't going to like me. People are going to get mad. I need to do it. And that is back to this point of doing things like the law of Moses just to do them. And when you have that conversation this week or even, even in your journal, over the past few weeks we've had you write in your journal, and I think in the beginning I said, what are the things that you're doing in your life that you need to stop doing? And is there anything in your life that you're not doing that you need to start doing? We could, you could start another journal page. Again, go look back in your journal because this has been that conversation. Is there anything in your life that you need to repent of? And we did code words where we're like, maybe that one thing. Well, continue looking at those things. And maybe in the adversity that you're experiencing, you can say, I need to work on that a little more. And I need to, I need, I need to become a new person or a new creature. And uh, let's go. This is go back to chapter five. Back to chapter five. And then uh, we're going to look in verse 17. Woohoo! This is the best. The closer I become to Christ through adversity, the closer I become to my Heavenly Father. As the enabling power of the atonement strengthens me and makes me into a, a new person. Um, this picture right here sits in my, in my office here. And I love this picture because it's that moment where I feel like I cannot do this. Can't do it another day. And I feel like I'm drowning. A friend put it this way. He said, I feel like I'm drowning in a hail, like in a rainstorm falling from the sky. That's how he put it, in all the adversity that they were experiencing this week. And that was a great time. Sometimes I feel like we're falling from the sky, rain is pouring, we're drowning, and we're still falling, we can't. I love this picture, because in the midst of our adversity, we feel like we're lost and no one's there, and that hand is being stretched out to do it. I love that picture. So chapter five, verse 17. I'll read verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, underline this phrase, he is a new creature. What? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Maybe... Maybe you're like me and you want to be better. And uh, I just, uh, I always just want to be better. I want to, uh, I want to choose better things and I want to be a little more kind and I, I just want to be better. But if I look back on it, Old things are passed away, and 
things are becoming new and I'm not the same person. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a country club for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. And none of us are perfect at this. And so in the midst of my adversity, sometimes I want to cry out why. I think of Joseph Smith in Doctrine and Covenants section 121 and 122. Sometimes we want to cry, Heavenly Father, why is this happening? But as my faith increases, and as I stay close, I recognize that all these blessings come from adversity. It's such a blessing in my life to be able to have those things. Would you now in your journal, or as a family, or whoever you're with, would you pause it and have a conversation about what blessings have you had in your life because of the hard things that you've had to go through. And if, as a family, you can have that discussion. And alone, you can have that journal discussion. After you have the discussion, recognize that the Lord, all the blessings, what blessings has the Lord given you because of your adversity? Because, my friends, when we follow the patterns, then we be reconciled to God meaning we turn to him and things are okay. We become reconciled and repentance and godly sorrow help make us a new creature. See, in Paul's writing to the Corinthians, it wasn't about them doing what he just, what he said. It was him trying to help them to be better saints. And uh, if you want a good gospel study, perhaps some extra credit, Here's a Dale G. Renlund's talk. I listened to this this week twice because I thought it was so good. From General Conference, October 2018, Choose You This Day. He, that's the one where he tells a story about Mary Poppins, and he quotes a little bit about Mary Poppins. And I'm just going to leave that with you. I hope that you are able to feel the power of Scripture study and why the Lord would want us to do Come, Follow, and Read. Remember, this is not a program. This is an opportunity for us to draw closer to God in personal study as we read it from his apostles and prophets and study the gospel of Jesus Christ. I sure think that this is great. Would you please keep reading your scriptures, keep using your journals. Again, as a reminder, this next week, if you're just catching on, I'm going to give you a challenge to go find yourself some scripture markers. If you're using digital scriptures, no worries. You already got them there. Subscribe down below so that we can keep in touch. I appreciate all of the love that we're getting over this one as we study the gospel together. Please share this on social media. Tell people you love them. Share the gospel. And we will be back next week with another study of Come Follow Me. Love you. Bye, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.